Archaeologists have made two rare discoveries that point, people men point to people mentioned in the scriptures. One find is a clay seal impression belonging to Nathan Melick. Melech is named in two kings as an official in the court of King Josiah. The other is a 2,600-year-old seal engraved with the name Ikar, son of, son of Matanyu. According to archaeologists, the Matanyu appears both in the Bible. Both items were found in the David National Park, and of course that is in Jerusalem. Israeli archaeologists made the discoveries in this structure where they found evidence of a big fire they believe dates back to 586 BC when the Babylonians destroyed Jerusalem. Here you can still see the ash from the fire. These discoveries shed more light on ancient Jerusalem and paint a more complete picture of King David's city. An excavation has revealed a 2,000-year-old Jewish settlement in the desert city of Beersheba. Beersheba right now is still a booming city. It's a desert metropolis home to more than 200,000 people. It's a big college town. It's a center of culture and industry, professional sports. And Jews, clearly, we now know, were happy to live there as well thousands of years ago. Meanwhile, Israeli archaeologists have also uncovered a Jewish suburb of Jerusalem from around the time of Jesus in an Arab neighborhood as part of a salvage excavation. The community likely interacted with pilgrims and provided goods for the second temple. Among other things, archaeologists found part of an oil lamp that was decorated with a menorah, one of the earliest ever discovered. New building construction here often uncovers ancient treasures. That's the case in the Jerusalem neighborhood of Sharafat. This site was a Jewish village 2,000 years ago. Archaeologists uncovered it as they were preparing the site for a new elementary school. The most spectacular find here is of a grand burial estate. So, so Beersheba now, as, as I was talking about, it's a big city. It's a major city in the desert. Yeah. Way back then, 2,000 years ago, at the turn, uh, was this uh, still a big city for that time, or was it really then even a small little outpost of Jews? Even then, it was really small. As I said, most of the Jews were uh, either in Jerusalem area or up to the north. Uh, so it's one of the only Jewish settlements that we know of in the south of Israel. All right, very interesting stuff, a very significant archaeological, archaeological find. One of my favorite words is anomaly. I like the way it sounds. I like even better what it implies. An anomaly, by definition, is anything or something that deviates from what is standard, normal, or expected. Anomalies are fascinating because they contradict the norm. They, they have no precedent. There's no repeated pattern that you can look at. They're really one-offs. Uh, they're outliers, if you will. Uh, they don't fit into the customary order or structure of things, and therefore they defy an easy explanation. One of my favorite anomalies is the nation of Israel. In every case, when you have a nation that's conquered, they lose their language, their religion, their culture and customs, even they're extracted from their homelands and their national identity is lost. In every case, it happens within a period of a few generations, maybe 70 to 75 years. You know, it's one of those kinds of things that happens because uh, even countries like Yugoslavia, which were tailor-made by the Soviets, there was never a Yugoslavia until the Soviets made Yugoslavia, but when Yugoslavia was broken up, you never meet anybody saying, well, I'm a Yugoslavian now. They basically are even a Slovak or a Czech or something of another uh, generation which goes back to a, a cultural identity. 
But the simple fact is when people are carried away into captivity, they soon become assimilated into whatever place and culture they become a part of. And yet when we look at the nation of Israel, we, we find a contradiction to that pattern. I mean, here's a people who are conquered, and not just conquered, they were enslaved, and they are carried away from their homeland. And it didn't just happen to them once, it happened to them twice. And the second time it happened to them, they were gone from their homeland for over 2,000 years, and yet today there is in the world a nation of Israel. They're back in the same geographic homeland that God had promised to them to Abraham, and they follow the same religious faith. They speak a language which was formerly described as a dead language. They revived a dead language and speak it now fluently in the streets of Jerusalem. And they have a clear sense of who they are. They are the Israelites. They are the people of Israel. And it's interesting to me because uh, a lot of times, even within Christian theology, there's this assumption that God worked with the Jews and then they rejected him and so he went to the Gentiles and all the promises that were given to Israel are now subsumed by the church. And yet that is one of the reasons why people have trouble understanding biblical prophecy because God has a covenant relationship with Israel that is unique to them. It's not better, it's not more important. Even in the matter of the reestablishment of the nation of Israel, we have, again, no other precedent. As was really kind of pointed out by the prophet Isaiah in the 66th chapter, when he said, who has ever heard of such a thing? Can a country be born in a day or a nation be brought forth in a moment? Yet, no sooner is Zion in labor, Zion is another term for Israel, no longer is Zion in labor than she gives birth. And that's one of the things that makes it really unique because on May 14, 1948, David Ben-Gurion proclaimed the establishment of the state of Israel. This was backed not only by the United Nations, but even President Truman recognized them as a new nation on that very same day. So that in the most literal sense, Israel was born in a day. They went from not being a nation to suddenly being a nation counted amongst the nations of the world in the United Nations. So Israel is the only nation who has ever been established that way. There's never been another nation that's been made like Israel was made in a day. And despite the fact that they had this continuing opposition of some 300 million Arabs in the surrounding nations. During the Six-Day War in 1967, Israel claimed a stretch of Syrian land known as the Golan Heights. The strategically important high ground has been controlled by Israel ever since. But the UN considers it occupied Syrian territory. But there has been little applause from the international community. Syria says it will further isolate the U.S. on the world stage. Russia calls it a clear violation of international law and may destabilize the Middle East. The UN says its position on the Golan Heights is unchanged. It remains, quote, occupied Syrian territory. Those who want to see Golan return to Syria say they aren't giving up. Let me ask about the peace process, so-called. On Monday, US President Donald Trump signed an executive order recognizing the annexed Golan Heights as part of Israeli territory in complete defiance of UN resolutions. Your prime minister reacted by saying, quote, everyone says you can't hold an occupied territory, but this proves you can. Does that mean, Ambassador, does that mean that the occupied West Bank can now be annexed too? Does that apply to the occupied West Bank as well? The Golan Heights for 19 years was, was used by the Syrians to attack our communities in the northern Galilee. And when we took over the Golan Heights in 1967, it became stable, it okay. became quiet. And you I annexed know some them in 1981. The UN condemned you, including the Ronald Reagan administration. Now, as you say, Trump is backing you. I'm wondering, are you now going to annex the West Bank as well? Because you have Trump's support. You're, you're a supporter of annexation, aren't you? You personally. I, I'm, not a f I'm not familiar with the plan of President Trump. I'm not asking about President Trump. I'm asking about the Israeli government. Okay, another reason that Palestinians might say they have no faith in you, and why the wider international community is so worried about Prime Minister Netanyahu's aims, is that you have a Prime Minister of Israel who supports anti-Arab racists and has even supported bringing them into his own government. I'm referring here to the Jewish Power Party, or Otzma Yehudit, whose leader calls himself a Kahanist, which is a banned terrorist group in the United States, and who himself was banned for running for office by Israel's own Supreme Court just last week because of his anti-Arab racism. 
I, I'm amazed from your passion, Mahdi. I haven't uh, heard you or anyone else uh, in your mm. network speaking about the Hamas leadership, or about radical. That's not PA, true, Danny Danon. About, I've, about I've actually had Hamas existed. people on the show. No, 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 I'm going to have to interrupt you. Hamas people have come on this show and I've challenged them on their intolerant language. I'm asking you about the Prime Minister of Israel. You claim to be a liberal democracy allying with anti-Arab racists. Can you please deal with that point? So, so uh, as a strong democracy, we have rules and the rule of law is above all. And uh, the Supreme Court decide, decided to disqualify one of the members of the, of the list who wants to become a member of Knesset, who used to be a member of Knesset because he used the uh, racist comments. The American Jewish Committee, the AJC, APAC, the lobbying group you spoke at this week, your staunchest allies in the US have called Jewish power a racist and reprehensible party. Why is the prime minister dealing with this party? Why is he welcoming them? Why is he so, allowing them to do a union with the Jewish home? The Prime Minister said one thing, that uh, this party can run for the Knesset, like the radical Arab parties are allowed to run for the Knesset. And the Supreme Court is the one to decide whether you are allowed to run or not to allow to run. He didn't say that they will be part of his government. He didn't say more than that. You're and not I, embarrassed by a party Maybe. whose leader has called for the expulsion of Arabs, another party whose leader has said there should be segregated maternity wards between uh, Palestinian and Jewish mothers. You're not embarrassed L linking Madi, hands with such I'm, parties? Uh, Madi, uh, our democracy allows radicals to be in the Knesset, in the parliament. When I was in parliament but for many years, and I heard MKs supporting Hamas, supporting Hezbollah, supporting Iran, uh, we accepted that. It wasn't comfortable for us, but we allowed that. This is the strength of our democracy, and it goes both ways. If you can allow Azmi Bishara, who betrayed our country, to be in the Knesset, you can allow radicals from the right to be in the Knesset, but as the Supreme Court ruled, there is a limit, there is a line. You keep talking about radicals, right? At APAC this week, you spoke at the APAC uh, policy conference in Washington, D.C. You attacked U.S. Democratic Congresswoman Ilhan Omar for her controversial criticism of APAC, some of which she's apologized for. You said, quote, if you have people that use that kind of language, eventually I think the public needs to remove them from office. Some would say, Danny Danon, shouldn't the same apply to you? You've called African asylum seekers in Israel infiltrators. You've called them a national plague. You've called for them to be expelled. Nothing Ilhan Omar has said has come anywhere near to that kind of dehumanizing rhetoric that you've used. So well, some of the quotes you mentioned are not correct, but let's speak Which about Which one is that. not correct? I think, that, uh, I think the fact that you have anti-Semites in Congress the public should decide whether they should continue or not. Same in Israel. If the public saw that I'm, my views are not correct, they wouldn't elect me again and again and again. And I think today when we see what's happening in the US, when you have radicals uh, speaking on anti-Semitic language and speaking about the Jews here having dual loyalty, this is embarrassing. I'm not is it deciding. not embarrassing when you refer to African asylum seekers as infiltrators and a national plague? So I, I don't think I said what you just mentioned. And uh, if you will find it, I will be very happy to, everything is videotaped today. Between Israel and Syria, there is never a recognized border. It, to, to get a recognized border, you need to have a peace agreement or a decision that the two states that uh, with the border accept. We need, between Israel and Syria, there is only a line of ceasefire. We ceasefire in 48 and ceasefire in 67. And, the, and ceasefire in 73. The fact that, uh, um, that this line is not a recognized international border according to international law means that it's not illegal for Israel to take it. And as the US signs off on Israel's illegal occupation of the Golan Heights, is it time to declare the peace process dead and buried? Even if you put aside the fact that Israel gained the Golan Heights when, she, when Israel was attacked and not, as, and not attacked Syria. So even if you put this aside, to say that it's illegal according to international law, law to Israel to apply its own sovereignty over the Golan Heights is just wrong. And despite the fact that they have this continuing opposition of some 300 million Arabs in the surrounding nations who are committed and repeatedly endeavoring to literally wipe them off the face of the earth. Sometimes people say, why are the Israelites so paranoid of the people around them and have every intention of pushing them out of the land and into the sea 
<clears throat> and, and literally many of them wanting to annihilate the Jewish people and not just the Jewish state. But there's a second anomaly that we find in history and it may surprise you because it's the anomaly of the church. The church itself is something that's hard to explain. See, when you consider the facts surrounding the church, its very existence today is hard to explain. As evidenced by, in fact, one of its greatest critics, a guy by the name of Bart Ehrman, who basically speaks against uh, biblical Christianity, uh, in the book, his, one of his books called The Triumph of Christianity, How a Forbidden Religion Swept the World, he made this statement, he said, how did a religion whose first believers were 20 or so illiterate laborers in a remote part of the empire, how did it become the official religion of Rome converting over 30 million people in just four centuries? And then he goes on, a handful of charismatic characters used a brilliant social strategy to win over hearts and minds one at a time. Now the reason I give you that quote isn't because what he said is accurate. In fact, most of what he just said is inaccurate. But nonetheless, it shows that even somebody who is antithetical to Christianity has to step back and say, how is it possible that there's this thing called the Church of Jesus Christ in the world today? That you look at all ordinary things and we shouldn't be here right now. Other than the very fact that in a very accurate way, Jesus said it would be the case when there was no sense of it. When we look at Israel today as a nation, we can say God has in fact kept his promise to Abraham and to Isaac and to Jacob and to Moses and to David. A promise that he said in Genesis 17, 17 was that he had an everlasting covenant to be God to you and your descendants after you, an everlasting covenant.